On the first day of racing school, you'll learn that the racing line is the fastest way around a track. Well, guess what? Just like a bunch of other stuff you learn in school, that's total bullshit. It's like Newtonian physics all over again. Thanks for messing that one up, Einstein. So open your eyes. They don't want you to know that in the real world, winning isn't about following some predetermined line. The best drivers in the world lead the pack because they don't follow the racing line. And today, we're gonna figure out how champions drive. So if you ever wanna be a champion, <laughs> and I think you do, you better stick around. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Thank you to Off The Record for sponsoring today's video. Listen up. Like my colleague, best lawyer friend, and occasional big spoon, ooh, told you yesterday, coppers are gonna be out in full force this 4th of July. They'll be keeping an eye out for you. Yeah, I'm talking about you, Nathaniel. They got a fast, easy, technologically centric way to fight your traffic ticket and save you money. They even offer a full refund if they're not able to either reduce or keep that ticket off your record. So enjoy your holiday and register now. Use code DONUT and save 10% off your first ticket at offtherecord.com slash donut. A successful race car driver has to develop racecraft. That's the art and science of winning, and it requires knowing the physics, strategy, and even psychology of racing. But the most basic part of that understanding is the geometry of racing, because that's how you begin to understand the racing line. It's day one in developing your own racecraft. Lewis Hamilton, he's on day 10,000. So you need to pay attention if you want to become a champ. So what is the geometric racing line? Well, that's the theoretically fastest way around a corner, and it's all about grip overcoming inertia. To understand why, consider a car going around and around in a circle. The faster the car goes, the larger that circle becomes. That's because the car's inertia overcomes its grip and it runs wide from its original path. If the car slows down, its grip can overcome that inertia and it can make tighter circles. As the car speeds up, its inertia overcomes its grip and it can't stay on that circle. The faster this car goes, the larger the circle path has to be to prevent a loss of grip and the car spinning off the path car cornering on a racetrack is following a circle. For every corner, there are multiple paths or lines a driver could choose. Now I could follow the inside line, but that would be slow because that circle has a short radius. Or I could follow the outside line and that would be faster because the circle has a longer radius. But there's a path with an even longer radius and that's the geometric racing line. The geometric line follows an out-in-out -out path relative to the track. The driver enters the corner at the turn-in point, steering towards the apex, and then unwinding the steering to move back towards the track out point. Geometrically, this creates the gentlest possible arc. It follows the largest circle and should be the fastest way through any corner. That's because the driver is turning as little as possible, using the least amount of grip necessary to overcome the car's inertia, and therefore able to maintain the highest speed. The maximum cornering velocity for a given circle is the square root of the radius of the circle times the force of gravity and the coefficient of friction, or more simply, grip. So if the radius of the circle increases, so does the max velocity. If your velocity exceeds that maximum, then your circle has to increase or you exceed the available grip. But if you increase grip, you can increase the max speed for this same radius. Or I guess if you could just increase the force of gravity, you'd have maximum corner speed, but that's just crazy. Or is it? The geometric racing line should be the fastest way around the corner, but driving that line doesn't always win races, especially in Formula One. So why? Well, one reason is because the geometric racing line is what a physicist might call a toy model. That's a mathematical model which only illustrates the most basic parts of a complex system. Because it makes assumptions and omits details, it doesn't accurately capture what's happening in the real world. So what sort of assumptions are made here? Well, for one, the corner's radius is assumed to be constant. On a Formula One track, most corners aren't simple arcs. They come in all shapes and sizes. You know, all corners are beautiful to me. Some with increasing radii, some with decreasing radii, some who do both. <laughs> Corners also come in groups or complexes, and the geometric line through one might put a driver onto a slower line for a subsequent corner. Another assumption is that the coefficient of friction remains the same. In the real world, grip is the result of tires and the track surface, and both of those things change when you're scooting along a racetrack. As the surface changes in temperature or in texture, 
your grip changes. As a tire's angle changes based on steering input, your grip changes. The amount of grip is constantly changing and the simple model of the geometric line doesn't account for this. There are also important and somewhat obvious details being left out of the tour model, like, oh, I don't know, cars have four tires. What? And the amount of grip usually isn't identical between them. One reason why the drift nugget is so hard to control is because the front tires have more grip than the rear. Differences in grip like this are often because of the distribution of a car's weight, another fact omitted from the model. As a car brakes, turns, and accelerates, its weight transfers side to side and back to front. When the weight of the car loads up certain tires, they gain grip and others lose it. F1 cars also produce literally tons of downforce, which isn't evenly spread across the tires. Downforce effectively increases weight and grip as speed increases, and that's not in the toy model either. So the racing line might be the fastest on paper, but the actual line isn't based on doing complex math. It's based on understanding three things the ever-changing track conditions, your opponents, and the specific details that make Formula One cars special. In other words, if you're Lewis Hamilton, you drive based on racecraft, and that tells you how to deviate from the racing line to make a race winning line. Think about that circle again. The maximum speed for any turn's radius is determined by the coefficient of friction, and that's based on the tires and the surface. So if tires remain the same, the top speed for a 100 meter circle will be different on a tarmac versus ice because the ice has a lower coefficient of friction. Knowing what the maximum grip is for your tires on that surface is a huge part of racecraft. But that's still missing a ton of important details that separate a simple mathematical model from a real F1 racetrack. Actual racetracks are bumpy. They have pavement seams and curbs that can launch a car off the road surface entirely. An airborne tire has a friction coefficient relative to the track of zero. Zero friction means zero grip. Tracks also get hotter and grippier as the temperature increases throughout the day. But as the sun angle moves, shaded sections of the tarmac can cool off. The braking zone for a corner could be grippy while the exit is slippery because of the temperature differences. Also, the parts of the track that have seen a lot of traffic, they get rubbered in as the day progresses. Those areas get grippier because the coefficient of friction between your tires and the rubber left by other cars is higher than between the tires and the tarmac. And in Formula One especially, less used areas get more slippery as marbles, those are loose chunks of rubber from F1's fast wearing tires, collect at the edge of the track surface. Turning some ideal fast lap might be good for qualifying, but it won't win you races. For that, you gotta know how to pass and how to keep your opponents behind you. If you guessed get off the racing line, give yourself a freaking high five and give me a like and subscribe. That really helps me out and I appreciate it. Understanding other cars and their drivers is a huge part of racecraft and champions know that when you've got opponents nearby, you can't stick to the racing line. So suppose you're Hamilton, you're following Mazepin, and he's managing to stay off the racing line for a change. <laughs> so should Hamilton stay on the line too? Well, not if he wants to win. To pass, he'll have to take a slower line, but one that puts him in front. Slow to go fast. What? Before every turn, there's a breaking point, which is where you have to start slowing down if you want to take the ideal line. That's what Mazepin is going to do. But Hamilton is going to outbreak his opponent, overshooting the normal breaking point. And instead of following the outside edge of the track, he's going to move to the inside and pass while braking. He'll be turning after the turn-in point at a much sharper angle than the ideal line. Now this passing line is actually much slower than the ideal racing line, but Hamilton, he'll end up in front, blocking the exit and wrecking what should have been Mazepin's fast line. So how could Mazepin, if he were a better driver, defend his position? A better defensive line is one that's just close enough to the inside edge of the track that an opponent won't fit, but far enough outside to maintain as much speed as possible. Again, it's a slower line than the ideal racing line, but it's one way that champions stay in front and win races. These are two simple examples of passing and defending lines, which, like the geometric line, don't include lots of details that lead to success. There are many other strategies too, and whether any one will work or not will depend on a lot of factors. Differences in power and grip Formula One's DRS, whether the corner is simple or part of a series, even how much race is left and what position each car is in can change the winning strategy. But all those strategies require knowing how and when to deviate from the racing line. And all of them only work when the drivers are competent and sane, because both passing and defending depends on the other driver not running into you. 
racecraft. It also includes knowing that staying on the fastest line or defending your position doesn't matter if it ends your race. Finally, of course, knowing all the ins and outs of track conditions and how to pass don't mean anything if a driver doesn't understand their car. Formula One cars have some pretty amazing abilities, which mean the winning line can be quite different from the geometric racing line. F1 cars can accelerate from zero to 300 kilometers per hour in under 10 seconds. They can also generate five Gs under braking, but they're limited to some of the fastest wearing tires on the planet. Designed to degrade quickly, they can become a full two seconds slower after just five laps. So a winning strategy has to include tire management. Lemony wear to maintain consistently fast times for 20, 30, 50 or more laps, depending on pitch strategy, even if no single lap is the fastest lap possible. That requires using a line with a slower entry, sharper turn in, and later apex. But why would you want to do that? Well, because F1 tires wear more under turning than braking or accelerating. That's because when a tire is turning, it's sliding sideways just a little bit. At the microscopic level, the rough road surface acts like sandpaper and is constantly removing a small amount of rubber from the slipping tire. This type of wear doesn't happen under ordinary braking or accelerating. So one way to make tires last is to spend as little time as possible turning. In an F1 car, you can do that by relying on the massive braking force to over slow the car at corner entry, then turn in harder, but at a lower speed to spend less overall time with the tire slipping and rely on the massive acceleration to get back up to speed at corner exit and beyond. This line has some other advantages in a Formula One car, and Hamilton is an expert at taking such a squared off line. Because he's braking further into the corner, he can apply brakes later on the straight. That makes this a good line for outbraking an opponent and passing. Also, because he's braking later, he's spending longer on the power and reaching higher speeds on the straights. That's also a result of the sharper turn in late apex. The car is pointed straight earlier in the corner, so full throttle acceleration happens earlier on the straights, leading to even higher speeds. Hamilton, he's a seven time world champion because of his racecraft, and a huge part of that is the line he chooses. It saves tires, helps with passing, and produces higher straight line speeds, and that leads to more consistent, faster laps. The end result is higher average lap times for longer than if he followed the line he might use in qualifying to produce the fastest single lap time. Formula One drivers, and especially champions like Mr. Hamilton, understand how varying conditions, their opponents, and the special characteristics of an F1 car mean that they can throw out the Racing 101 textbook. The racing line will only get you so far. And in F1, it definitely won't get you on the podium. Here's me on the podium. Yeah, the crowd's going wild. I'm like, yeah, mm, yeah, put a big old like wreath around my neck. It's a wreath. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of B2B. Follow us here on Donut at Donut Media. Follow me on Instagram at Jeremiah Burton. If you want to see some extra content from this episode, uh, follow me on TikTok. I'm on, my name is Suck My Truck. They didn't have Uncle Jerry, and that's what I went with. Till next week, bye for now.